everybody, welcome to Goots' Wrestling Pod. I'm your host, Ray Goots, and uh, with me is Andrew Lee, bro. Andrew Lee, how you doing? All right, can't complain. Um, we are talking today about this Tuesday in Texas. Not this Tuesday, we're talking about a Tuesday in 1991. And um, we're, even though this is coming out on a Friday and we're recording this on a Wednesday, uh, we're not going to get too much into, actually we won't get into current events at all because we're recording this so early. We're recording this before Full Gear. When this comes out, Full Gear will be like almost a week old. So whatever, like, it's... it's Wait, when, be, when are we putting this out? Not this, fr- um, the Friday after Thanksgiving. Oh, okay. All right. Two I'll weeks be in California. Great. I'll be, I'm in California as you guys listen to this that Friday. But there's really no reason to talk about Tony uh, AEW because everything might change. Of after. course. There may not be an AEW. So, like, what we're saying, these guys are going to be like, what are they talking about? Like, CM Punk came out and fucking. It may, er- it may merge with the uh, NWA. You never know what's going yeah. on. So, so um, let's, uh, let's get right into Tuesday of Texas. Which I kind of felt like this was the second half of that sur- of Survivor Series. Like this felt like these two shows feel like they're supposed to be one big giant show. This show could have been a big show, but they they screwed it up in so many ways, or they didn't do something right in so many ways. Um, I mean, I now, think there's only one. There's only really one segment that they do really right. And yeah. Now, did I? enjoyed the show yeah for the most part i did i can't say it was like a really good episode of raw if raw was around yeah Mm -hmm. but there was like so there's some do you mind if i go through the history the background of what this show is yeah all right this show was an attempt by junior vince mcmahon junior to establish tuesday as basically a secondary night for for pay-per-views Pay-per-views were like on always on the weekends, but he wanted to, he like so badly wanted to do a weekday pay-per-view, right? And um, that's why they did this. And the reaction wasn't good. And they also did a very disappointing buy rate. It was a 1.0, which is basically, I looked at, they said that it's equivalent to about 40, 400,000 buys, mm-hmm. which is a lot. For some promotions, but not WWF at that how, time. How many did SummerSlam do? Do you know that? SummerSlam? Um, I mean, how many buys did that SummerSlam do? SummerSlam or Survivor Series? SummerSlam, let's say. SummerSlam. Uh, pay-per-view buys. Well, I don't know. We'll look it up right now. I'll look it up. But... Uh, basically, what ended up happening was because of the buy rate, they said that it's a, this experiment's a failure, and then they never went back to a weekday pay per view again until 2004 Tab- when Tab- they Tuesday. did Taboo Tuesday. I totally forgot about Taboo Tuesday until I looked it up. What what is Junior's like hard on for Tuesday pay per views? I mean, why does this guy love Tuesday pay per views? It, because when he has an idea, he's going to work on it until, until he's right. And um, I think, like, you know, if he still had power, he would try another Tuesday pay-per-view. You know? he you has- he, Yeah, I, I agree. He probably, if he was still in charge, he probably would have tried another stupid fucking Tuesday pay-per-view. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, ta- Taboo Tuesday, I mean, back then, I I didn't mind. I, there was only two Taboo Tuesdays, and they changed the Cyber Sunday. I didn't mind the two taboo Tuesdays, but Tuesday's just a weird night. It's just a weird day to watch a pay per view. Okay, so um, actually the numbers were wrong. SummerSlam nineteen ninety one had four hundred and five thousand, uh, four hundred. Basically, it had a four hundred thousand buys. This Tuesday in Texas had one hundred and uh, one. It had basically. 140,000 buys. So it's, it's hold about... On one second. Hold on one second. What, what happened? One second. One second, guys. Guys, uh, sorry, I had the dog stuff. Hey, so listen, let's talk... Um, Let's talk... So what was the SummerSlam buy rate? Yes, so SummerSlam 1991 had 405,000 buys. Yeah. And the this Tuesday in Texas had 140,000 buys. So it's almost like like 250,000 less, right? Yeah. So, it didn't... well, again, like I said, like even if you really wanted to see this show, it's so hard to justify after you, because after you just paid all this money for Survivor Series to buy another show six days later or whatever, you know? 
Yeah, like, you know, one of the things is this. It's like, all right, this guy wanted, Junior wants to make a pay-per-view on Tuesday work. But if you want it to work, there's so many things you're doing that's not letting it work. Number one, like you said, having it a week after a pay-per-view already, like, how are you, how is that supposed to work? Right. Well, I think he thought it, it, it's going to be so dramatic. People are going to be like, I need to see what's next. Then he could like sell it to me. I think that's dumb. I think he should have been like somewhere in the middle. Like there's enough time in between. And also, here's another thing. There's, if you look at the lineup, at the card for this show, there's so many good matches that are dark matches. Like Ric Flair versus Roddy Piper. Mm -hmm. The Natural Disasters versus Legion of Doom for the tag titles. Why aren't these on? If you really want this pay per view to succeed, why aren't you advertising those matches and why aren't you putting them on on, because, on the thing? I think he because he wanted to keep the 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 cost down. I think you get paid less if you're not on TV. I think he wanted to he wanted to charge less because he knew like okay, this is a gamble for me to make people buy a pay per view six days later. He's never did this before, so he's like, I got to keep it short. I got to keep the cost down so I can I can charge less because if I'm charging less. More people might buy it. That's probably that's probably true. And Roddy Piper could probably be like, "Well, if I'm on the pay per view, I want this much because I'm Roddy Piper." Exactly. Yeah, but you know what? If you're gonna go half ass, you expect half ass results. Is basically what well, that's happened. that's what happened. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, also don't call it this Tuesday in Texas. That's the dumbest name for a pay per view I've ever heard. It's stupid. I know. You should just no. put like Texas Showdown or something. Yes. Hey, Texas Showdown or fucking Texas, Texas Shootout. I the two know. the two main matches are basically showdowns. Yeah. And I it's just like there's so many things like he could have done differently. Like when I look at the buy rates and be like, oh, it wasn't successful, I'll be like, well, look at the effort he put in, you know? So yeah, whatever. And you know, like I think the Macho Man Jake the Snake match was was good, had a good buildup. But I also like when you see how um Hogan treats Undertaker, it's pretty apparent. Like, he only put over Undertaker that day because he knew he was going to make him look like an idiot six days later. So, you know, yeah. like, like it's just like, you know, you probably should have just done Jake the Snake and Macho Man at Survivor Series and then Hogan beat Undertaker. But, I mean, I do think long-term, again, Hogan's not thinking this, but I think long-term, Undertaker beating Hogan at Survivor Series, at the, sh at, you know, a show that has such a history, that added to his mythos. I don't think they thought of that that at the time, but I, that really added to his mythos. No one looks at, no one really thinks about Tuesday in Texas. They just think that. I don't think they were realizing this, but a hundred percent does add to the the legend of the Undertaker. Yeah, you know? it doesn't yeah. matter. They lose it six days later because no. that, nobody talks about it. You're right, yeah. exactly. Nobody talks yeah. about that. But now, if he lost, if Hogan just straight up beat him, um. Then I don't I don't know if we would have even had a streak. I don't know. Yeah. Well, we'll get into this. This tech this Tuesday in Texas taking place December 3rd, 1991 in San Antonio, Texas. Eight thousand people are in attendance. Uh and there's no like opening graphic. We just start with a recap, recap of Survivor. Of what just saw at Survivor Series. The same yeah. Yeah, absolutely. This is just like, yeah, you're right. It feels like a continuation of the previous pay-per-view. They're doing a recap. And then Gorilla Monsoons welcomes us to what looks like a packed house. 8,000 is still still packed. Gorilla Monsoon and uh, Bobby the Brain Heenan are on commentary. And we're going to go straight to our first match. It's for the Intercontinental Championship. It's Brett the Hitman Hart versus Skinner. Oh, by the way, what do you think of the shirt? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's a good Jake the Snake Roberts shirt, man. Brother. Good one. This is basically his show, so I feel it was appropriate. Yeah. Uh-huh. I, I, I think you're right. It is appropriate shirt for today's show. Uh, We get the full Bret Hart entrance. We're talking about, like, him coming in and fucking, like, with his Sergeant Pepper jacket, and he gives uh his, his shades to a hysterical fan. This girl, he gives this girl, this, she looks like a like preteen a girl and she's freaking the her and her friends when she receives the yeah. shade her and her friends start freaking out they go hysterical well bobby the brain heenan calls her a bimbo i started laughing he called a child a bimbo <laughs> well, here, here's the thing i forgot and this reminded me women were really into bret hart back then Oh, hundred percent. Yes, he was. Uh, he was considered a very good-looking man, and I think we forget about that because I don't know. We just don't think about things like that. But 
I remember like even when he was in the Heart Foundation, I remember like my friend's mom being like, that, he's a good looking man. He's like a good looking guy. I forget which documentary I saw, but there's I think it might have been like in the uh maybe one of the dark sides or something. But one of Bret Hart's sisters talks about it and she goes like, it was weird because like girls who will be picking on me in school, like a year later, they'll be like, your brother is so cute. And I'll be like, you were like beating me up last year. Right? Yeah. And must, he, he was, very, he was a heartthrob, like everywhere he went pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. And, he was, and you know, you kind of, I feel like Montreal has kind of raised that. Cause all you hear now is like, I got screwed and Goldberg and Vince and Goldberg and Vince. He, and like we forget, like oh, the reason one of the reasons why it made sense for Vince to push this guy is the women were really into him. So yeah, I mean he's not an ugly dude. You know? No, 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 I know, but like I forgot yeah. that was like I remember that was the big thing with him because I remember like more and more. It's it's kind of it was odd back then from women to just be like the volunteer and even girls in my class the volunteer like I think that guy's hot. Yeah, they didn't yeah, say that I mean, about a lot of other male wrestlers. I've seen, if you think about it nowadays, I've heard people say that about Hook. Yeah. Yeah, like women go gaga for Hook, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, Brett Roman. Yeah. Brett, but Brett was super over with the women. And uh, you know what? Else? He's got a, you know who, uh, so in this match, he's like going against Skinner. And like, when I looked at Skinner, I was like, man, they really could have, in my opinion, made this gimmick work. If they made him like kind of like look more like I don't know Crocodile Dundee and like less like a fucking homeless bum, because he just looks like a bum, dude. Well, <laughs> apparently this is how he would actually dress the guy. Oh, this is how Steve Kern actually dresses. Yes, that's what Bruce Pritchard said. This is how no. he would he would hunt. Uh, he would do hunting in the swamps, and this is how he would dress. This is where they got the idea. Oh, well, it's like, you know, Bret Hart doesn't really walk around with a fucking Sergeant Pepper jacket. I mean, can you guys just change it up? Realize it doesn't well, work? Well, the whole gimmick, he he hunts things in the swamps, which is what Steve Kern does, and that's how you're supposed to dress when you hunt. Oh, well, it just looks so bad. He's got this unkempt hair. He's no. drooling fucking tobacco tar everywhere, and he's got, like, shit stains all over his khakis. Like, yeah, just like this. That he just literally got out of the swamp to go wrestle. That's the idea. Not, I don't know. No, he looks like he got out of the fucking gutter, dude. Yeah. Like he's like a homeless person. If he, dude, if I think if you with the right gear, this gimmick could have worked. I really think so. Yeah. You know? We're not talking like main event, but we're talking like like maybe well, with the model Martel, good mid card position. Here's, here's the know? thing. He's a really good. This is the best match in the show. He's a fucking great worker, Steve Kern. Skinner. Steve Kern's a good worker. And that's what I'm saying. This I, I I just I really think this gimmick helped held him back, but it could have been a gimmick that could have hundred percent. Anyways, uh, most of this match is Skinner putting the heat on Bret Hart. You know, just beating him, beating him the whole match, and he hits his inverted DDT, which is called the Gator Breaker. Think like Scorpion Death Drop, but he does a relaxed cover, and Bret kicks out of it. Bret eventually makes a comeback, and he hits a sharpshooter for the win. Um, what did you think, man? Anything you want to add? Uh, I just thought it was a great, well, the one thing is they keep going, like, he's undefeated, Skinner. It's like, he lost, like, six days ago in Survivor Series. Like, what the fuck are you talking about undefeated? Like, like, you're not even, like, paying attention. Like, it's why, I know Vince likes to make up history, but, bro, this literally was the last show I watched, and he lost to Duggan's team. But, no, I thought it was a great match. It was a great opener, man. Bret Hart was fucking over with this crowd. They loved him. And, I thought it was a really good match, and Skinner. I it, Bret Hart proved why he should why he should be considered for the world title with this match. He even made Skinner look like look like a credible challenger, like like a like. For, yeah, for like, thirty uh, years, I'm sitting here thinking Skinner's a joke, and he made Skinner look good. Yeah, yeah, you know, and I think part of Bret Hart's appeal is like he looks good getting his ass kicked. You know, like he's like the, he does a really good job of being that sympathetic character, you know? Yeah. So whoever's beating the shit out of him always looks good because this guy's like, oh, he, this guy's, cr-, you know, he, he look how much he's destroying Bret Hart, you know? And so, yeah, it's a, it's a good match. It's off to a good start. Sean mm-hmm. Mooney, he's in the back with Jake Roberts, who cuts a promo on Randy Savage and Elizabeth and Jack Tunney. And, and it's just a little too long for my take. Oh, I thought uh, it was a great promo. I thought everything... You know I'm sorry, go ahead. I thought everything Jake did on this show was fucking magic, man. 
everything is good except for this is one pet peeve that I have. What's that? He says, trust me way too fucking much, especially in this first promo. He was saying it like after end of every sentence. And I could tell it's like a mandate probably put on him by like Junior. You yeah. gotta say, trust me. You gotta say. If well, you they were trying to get over that 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 he's a constant liar and like trust me, like he he'll like he's trying like he he's trying and then he says it even he goes, I told you that I wasn't gonna bring out the snake and like I told you yeah, I was. Gonna I know, but it's just like it's in his theme song. It's uh, it's in. He just says it way too much in this first prompt. He just said it like literally every sentence. They were trying to get. They were trying to make that his uh, Austin three sixteen. Yeah, and that's why even Austin wouldn't say Austin three sixteen like five times in one promo. He would just say it like once. I'm just just say it once. That's it. Just gotta say it one time. That's all you gotta do. Um, it's just too much for me. Um, speaking of trusting me, Gene is with Savage. Who also says, Ooh, you want me to trust you? You want me to trust you, Jake Roberts? Who back says back. that shit way too much? Oh my God. They So he's cutting a promo on Jake Roberts about trusting him. And they focus in on Liz's face. She has probably the best worried face in all of wrestling history. Yeah. This woman is just constantly worried. I think. <laughs> you know, she's going to get beaten in the back. If, if this she's doesn't... always in a state of anxiety. Somewhere. She always looks so worried. That's just like I think. It's a, I think that's just her natural face. Well, I mean, like if I think if you are if you're dating Macho Man Randy Savage, that's that's just how you that's just how you go through life. Just just constantly be freak out. <laughs> you're probably right. That's probably right. Um, we're gonna go. This is gonna lead to our second match. By the way, what's happening is while Macho Man's cutting his promo, Jake Roberts' music. Is. Mm-hmm. And he goes, "That's Jake Roberts' music. He's going on. He's he's on his way to the ring, right?" And he goes, "Oh, I'll be, all right, this is over." And he, he leaves. And what he's gonna do is, as Jake's walking towards the ring, Randy will attack him from behind. I actually really like this, and I wish they would do this more often now. Where they, somebody's they, they, cutting up. What? Sorry. I like the fact that he's so pissed he can't wait for. He's like, I'm not even gonna go with the formality of walking out to the ring. We're just gonna start this fucking match. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like he can't wait, and it makes sense. This guy, he he attacked him at his wedding. He had a cobra bite him in the arm. He just he would want to kill this guy, right? So he's like, as soon as I know where he is, right, I'm gonna kill him. And when he hears his entrance music, he goes, Oh, he's going on his way to the ring. I'm gonna go fuck him up right now. Right now, they're in AEW. They're doing this stupid Swerve versus fucking Hangman Adam Page. And Swerve broke into Hangman's house and, like, basically, like, was hovering over his newborn baby. Wouldn't, like, Hangman want to, like, kill this fucking guy? No. No. Because I guess not. But, like, I feel like this should be the same. Yeah, if that was Macho Man, if that was the Macho Man character, like, Swerve wouldn't even be able to get into the building at the next time. Yeah, like he'll be like, as soon as I know where you are, Swerve, I'm gonna fucking kill you. Yeah, like, absolutely. What did Hangman Page reaction? Because I, I remember he did cut a promo last week, but I felt like it was like more about how what a great wrestler he is. What was his reaction to this? Um, I don't know. I don't watch the. I haven't watched. So the he either. had really no re. Well, let's see what happens on Sunday. I mean, or, yeah. or tonight. Yeah. But I think you're right. It's about who's who's a better wrestler. But I'm a better wrestler. And he but this one, he didn't, he didn't have the world title long enough. Like after the guy's hovering over his baby, yeah, dude. I will say this, man. He again, and maybe again, it's hard. I don't want. We can't really talk about AEW because they might change everything on full gear, dude. They made Edge into just another guy. He has the 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 the, the non Midas touch, Tony Khan, and just not making anything feel special. Like say what you will, say what you will about. The Jake Roberts Macho Man thing, and the Undertaker Hogan thing. This show, they do everything they can to let you know that these two matches are special. And I know feel like Tony Khan has no ability to do that. Like, like fucking t- like on a Dynamite, Swerve Scott could murder Hangman Page baby. And the next segment, if it's the bu- well, the Bunny quit. If it's uh, Ali Catch making her debut fighting Sky Blue, then I'm gonna mention that Swerve Scott murdered a baby. Like he lit the baby on fire, and they're gonna they're just gonna be like. Sky Blue has a 
has a 12 match losing streak. Like they're not going to be like, oh my God, the baby's on fire in the back. You can get my point. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Th- and this is where we're talking about where story is important, right? Yeah. Like you gotta, if you're going to do a story, which AEW does do stories, but you got to be consistent with your story, right? And in this story of Jake Roberts versus uh, Randy Savage, Jake Roberts has really fucked with Randy Savage in two big instances. So Savage wants to kill this fucking guy and attacks him before, yeah, he even gets to the ring. And he's attacking him with all his fucking, uh, his like hat and everything on. And let me tell you something, Savage, he's got the most ridiculous gear on in this match. He's got like neon green tassels. He's got like this neon green hat with this huge fucking fake feather. And he takes it all off. And he's wearing like checkered rodeo clown gear. Like it's a full body outfit. It's, like it looks like a rodeo clown. And I was like, why is he wearing this shit? Is it because he's getting off the juice? Um, I mean, he I, I, that's what he started wearing. He started wearing he he started covering up his uh, body. Uh, maybe that's why he started. Maybe he maybe he got self conscious about how he looks. So he started covering up his body. Yeah, because when he you know in the before he's wearing the tidy white. He's just like. The trunks and now he's wearing like a full suit that covers his entire body he, and he i'm eventually... wondering if he's really he just goes... cutting off steroids that's why yeah. he never goes back to trunks like he sometimes in wcw he'll be shirtless but he never goes back to trunks it's just not something he ever does i wish he did because this outfit looks ridiculous this i love fucking... this outfit i love all his outfits to me he could you, you like this rodeo clown look yeah oh this was awful look everything this is... every outfit of his i liked from here, from the, when he first walked out to when he uh, to when he ends his career in WCW. I like every single one of his outfits. He's never had a bad outfit to me. Wow. I will disagree. I think if I want you guys to watch this Tuesday in Texas and just take a look at Savage's outfit. It looks terrible. Anyway, Jake Roberts is working on uh, Savage's left arm. Remember, this is the arm that the Cobra bit, right? And he's got this you know, he's ripping off. They got the blood-stained gauze on it, and oh, he's just where he got bit. Savage, though, all of a sudden hits an elbow drop for the clean victory in six minutes. I was like, well, that's a little underwhelming. This is a big-time feud, and it's a six-minute match, and it's over like that. And I was like, that's kind of weird. Um, be- before we get into that, how did you feel about that? That was that was the gist of the match. It was like six minutes. Um, yeah, well, I don't think the match was important. I think it was the post match. I think it was supposed to be like Savage just kind of caught him out of nowhere, but then Jake made him pay for it. I think that this was supposed to culminate at WrestleMania. J- There's a reason why, by the way, this gets abandoned that Jake that Jake has revealed recently. Um, but let's continue the let's continue the breakdown. I'll tell you why this was abandoned. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so the match is now over. Yeah. And as Jake's, you know, remember Jake Roberts took a uh, Savage elbow. So he's laying in the ring. Savage goes and gets a chair because he's like, this is not over for me. I'm going to get this guy as much as he got me. Tony Gurria stops him from getting a chair. So he fucking goes and goes, oh, I'm going to get a ring bell instead. He gets the ring bell. I feel like back- it's not bigger because they remember the Ricky Steamboat angle. They're like, holy shit, he's going to do what he did to Ricky Steamboat. Yeah, exactly. From WrestleMania 3, he grabbed the ring bell to use our Ricky Steamboat. And he's going to do the same thing here. Or he's alluding to the same thing yes. here. And as he gets the ring bell, Earl Hepner, the referee, grabs the ring bell. And he's like, dude, no, you can't do this. It's over. Match is over. And while that distraction is happening, Roberts gets up and hits a DDT on Savage. Both men are down. Both men are selling their injuries. And as they get up, Roberts hits a second DDT. And this is where it starts getting really good. Well, let me tell you something, and I real I, I'm like they could never do this in AEW because they've established that Roberts' finish is so devastating, right? The yes. fact that he hits him with two means that Savage cannot get up to help his girl because he also then hits him with a third. So it's plausible that Savage is lying there like a sack of shit while his girl's being tortured. Whereas in AEW, like this would never work because like, I don't know, like, like, let's say they're going to torture Britt Baker. They'd have, they have to handcuff Adam Cole because he kicked, everyone kicks out of everyone's finisher. So if you hit him with two finishers, he's just laying there while Britt Baker's being tortured. It, it, you know what I'm saying? Like it's, this it's, is the, this is the problem that you occur when you don't protect any moves. Exactly. Basically. Yeah. Exactly. This is what happens when, um, 
people are just going spot, 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 and they don't sell any move anymore. So this is, so this is what happens. Yeah. The other thing is, I think the reason why the match is short is to show that if Savage hits his finisher out of nowhere, it's over. But then Jake does the same thing. Jake is like, I hit my finisher now out of nowhere, and now you're done. And now I'm going to fuck it. And then, and, then, and then Jake's like, I'm going to hit another one. So it's like, these guys have finishers that can just take you out like that. If they hit that's them. a good point. I think that's a very good point. So while Savage is laying in the ring, all hurt, Roberts goes to leave, and then he's like, you know what? No. And he comes back and he goes, Ah, he said it's never gonna be at ringside, but it's underneath the ring. He technically did not lie. He pulls up the apron, the curtain on the uh, apron curtain, and he pulls out a small bag. This is the cobra bag. People are starting to go, oh. And Earl Hepner, and when he throws the fucking bag in the ring, Earl Hepner does a great job just selling the fucking bag. Like, he's scared of his fucking bag. He jumps, and he's just, like, really angry at Jake. And get the fuck out of here. He's trying to get him to leave. Great job by Earl Hepner. He's, he makes that moment when he enters Jake and re-enters the ring. Like, he really makes that moment. Because it's like nobody knows what to do because it's like, I want to tell, I want to pull this guy off Savage, but I don't want that snake to bite me, too. Yeah, yeah. He shows the urgency of that moment, and that's when the crowd really starts, the murmuring starts really yeah. wrapping up. Liz runs down, and she comes out to bed. She's covering her uh, Savage, who's still down, and she's begging, and she's begging, but all it does is it gets Jake Roberts to hit another DDT on Savage. It's the third one, as Ray said. Now he's really fucked. And he's taunting Liz. He goes, come on, beg. Beg, and I'll maybe I'll let him go. And ultimately, and like Liz is crying and shit. Ultimately, he grabs her by the hair, picks her up, and he slaps her. And well, let me tell you, the it, crowd does not like this. People are pissed the fuck they off. They get so they get they, there's like a there's like a gasp in you hear like a like twenty thousand. I've never heard twenty thousand people gasp before until he, when he grabs Liz by the hair, and yeah. they're all just gasping. And man, he is just uh, some of the best heel work I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah. When he slaps her. People do not are not happy. Fucking Earl Hepner gets right in his face and he kind of gets shoved by Jake. And like even Earl's like, I'm gonna fucking punch you after that, you know? And great job by great job by Roberts. Even, even when Pat Liz. Patterson comes in the ring, he has a great expression. Like yeah. he just looks like, what the fuck? You know? Yeah. Yes. Finally, a second referee finally comes to the ring. Jack Tongley finally comes out and he's just like, get the fuck out of here, get the fuck out of here. He's angry at Jake, and Jake reveals, oh, there's no snake in this bag at all. I see. <laughs> trust me. Trust me. And then uh, Liz basically holding her face, crying, uh, as she walks with Savage, who's being helped out to the back. Uh, before we get to the backstage segments, give me your thoughts. Any extra thoughts you had on this? I thought this was fantastic. I thought Jake is the fucking man. You know, it's so funny, because three years before this, we're watching Survivor Series 88, and the crowd loves Jake. They love him. Mm, he's mm -hmm. such a lovable guy. And now they fucking hate him. And I thought to myself, this is the power of Savage and Roberts. You know, sometimes they go like, well, it's too hard to keep this guy heel. Or it's too hard to keep this guy. I feel like the Savage and, and Roberts mentality is like, if I want you to cheer for me, you're going to cheer for me. But the second I want you to boo me, you're going to want me to fucking die. Like, that's the power I have over you. You know what I mean? Because I think that's, I think you're absolutely right about that. Yes. Like if you don't have a say in if you're going to like me or not, like you don't have, I will tell you. And I think wrestlers miss that, especially a guy like MJF. Like, I think they don't know how to do that. They, they just don't know how to actually get you to not like them. And then like, because I feel like if, if Jake the Snake decide the next day, I, I'm going to have the fans cheering for me. He could just do it in a second back then. um, Man. Let me just say, I was like, I started getting mad at Jake the Snake because I'm like, dude, you really are like the GOAT. You are, you could have been the GOAT. Like you are reaching GOAT status. This is the best you've ever been. And you let drugs and you let bullshit. You, you know, Vince was still going to push this guy even after he lost Undertaker. And he quits the day of WrestleMania 8. And he said it was never the same between him and Vince. And I don't blame Vince. Because it's like, you're quitting on me. You're at the height of your power and you're letting drugs dictate what you do. Why the fuck would I ever get behind you again? Except as a joke. And um, 
dude, it's like you you have is no one. Is that why he quit because of drugs? He quit because he was frustrated with Vince, but he was like, basically, yeah, the drugs made me quit. Like he was fucked up, and he was like, I quit. He was like, annoyed. Yeah, was drugs like, can influence your brain so that you make some stupid ideas with Savage. Yeah. So now you want to know why this eventually gets dropped? This whole storyline. So Liz comes from the hillbilly mountains of Kentucky, right? Her family was very uneducated. And remember, back in the day, they didn't tell people this was fake. So when Randy Savage, because he had or he had married, they were married for years. That whole marriage was when Randy Savage asked the parents for her hand in marriage, like, we know you're a wrestler. We know you're going to put her on TV. We don't want anything bad to happen to her. And Savage said, I'm going to protect her with my life, right? Nothing bad will ever happen to her. So remember, they think wrestling is real. So they're watching this show. And, uh, Jake the Snake smacks Elizabeth. Savage came home and the father was waiting for him with a shotgun and said, you said my daughter would never be hurt. What the fuck was that? I'm gonna, I'm not mad at Jake. I'm mad at you for letting my daughter get hurt. And uh, they had to quickly smarten the family up. But the family was like pissed at him and they had to drop it. Otherwise, the family was going to like the family was going nuts. They wanted Wait, to- why did the family get nuts even after they smartened her up? Smart I know up. they smartened the family up, but the family still wanted to wanted to go after Jake. Like the family wanted to murder Jake. Is that real? Is this real? That's what Jake has said. I I don't Savage Elizabeth. Are oh dead. wait, Jake Roberts said that. I don't. Fuck I don't. I mean, if I can listen, if I can see an interview with Elizabeth or Savage or even Lex Luger, because remember he was fucking Elizabeth for years. If one of the if Lex, we should ask Lex if he could confirm that. But that's what a lot of people said. I think Bruce Pritchard said the same thing. That the family pulled a gun on Savage when they got home from this show. Oh, I, I'm gonna have to look that up. That would be really interesting if that was a true story. Um, uh, dude, you know she died at she was 42 years old when she died. No, she was That's super so young. fucking young. That's I, like I mean, but I mean, like you know what? He didn't hold his promise because that business did destroy her. Like she, she, she'd probably still be alive if if he didn't bring her into business. I don't know. Um, you know, but you know, like, there's so many drugs these wrestlers take that I've never seen. You know, like, and she, the drugs that she was taking, she was she discovered these drugs because she was in a locker room with other with the wrestlers. She's not gonna discover it, like, you know. Yeah, but did anybody force it on her? Like, see, it's like no, I, I always know. have a hard time with stuff like that because I'm like, was she wasn't taking bombs or her body's fucking aching and she got to take these pain. She's doing this shit voluntarily. Nobody's going like, Liz, if you don't take these drugs, you're out of this business. Nobody's fucking. No, I saying know, that. I know. But I'm just what I'm yeah. saying is like, it's 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 you when you when you when you're raised. It depends on your environment where you are. We're we're not in that environment, so we can't say that we would have fallen to temptation. We can say we wouldn't have fallen to temptation, but we're Maybe. not we're not entering that environment at like twenty. We've had a different environment, so you know. That's true. Well, I guess uh, as. One would say, fragile mind, fragile ego, fragile body. <laughs> Actually, Dean Malenko cut that. I mean, not Dean Malenko. Yeah, Dean Malenko. Dean Dean Ambrose Mal- cuts that promo to Liz's family. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyways, um, this keep- angle is fantastic, but it keeps going, okay? Yeah. Jake Roberts. Oh, this um, is a great promo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, uh, it, it gets it gets even better, okay? Um, but, but, but I forgot where it has that. Oh yes, Jake Roberts. He is now in the back because he he left first, and he's with Mean Gene. And Mean Gene is fucking mad at this guy. And Gene's like, I know. Jake goes, Gene, congratulate. Me. And Gene's like, Are you kidding me? You're a sicko. Like, and then he and Jake goes like, He goes, Jake. He, no, Gene goes like, You're a sicko. How could you? You slap the woman. And then Jake Roberts goes, I slapped her because no man wants a woman who begs. <laughs> I was like, Jesus, this guy. And he starts going like, yo, it felt real good DDTing you, Randy. And he's like feeling his body. He's like, oh, it felt real good. And he goes, but you know what? It felt even better slapping your wife. And I'm like, this guy, this is like probably the best despicable heel promo. It's almost like he saw Ric Flair's promo at Survivor Series, and he was like, "Yo, I can one up that." <laughs> That's what it felt dude, like he was doing. Great, despicable promo here, dude. At this moment, he at this moment, I'm gonna say this. At this moment, he is the man in the business. And if I was Vince, I would have said to him, "If you can stay sober 
I'm going to give you the title, but you've got to stay sober because if you can stay sober, maintain this, there's no telling where we can go together. And yeah. uh, dude, at this right, at, I've ne- I, I, I'm never really I'm watching all this and we're watching that because I, I've seen this show when I was younger, but now being older, knowing he is the man. He is the man. At this moment, he becomes the man of the business and he pisses it all away. <laughs> yeah, he ends the promo basically by saying, you know, this isn't over between me and Randy. And he goes, yo, dude, bring her out again. Because he was like, I would love to touch her. Which is great. Just like, because it's, you know, it's like very tongue in cheek. It's like, he's like saying like how you want, like he would love to touch her again, hitting her. But there's also a little, a little sexual tension there because of the way he's moving his butt and everything. It's just perfect. You know what? And, and no one has ever done this to Savage because everyone's been afraid to go because they know Seth. And he's basically like, I want you to fucking go nuts. I want you to come back and come get me. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I'll, probably. And I'll hit her again. And like, it's just like, because then you're, as a fan, you're like, oh my God, Savage. These two might murder each other. Like, uh-huh. like this should have ended like in a bloody steel cage. This feud. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, he yeah. ends this great promo with another shitty trust me. So it loses a star for my take. That, that okay. was Vince. So, uh, three, and it's, three and a half quarter stars. For Vince, is under, Vince is like, if Vince has a sign. If you don't say trust me, I'm going to hide your drugs. Yeah. Dude, he... Go back and watch both promos. See how many times this fucking guy says, trust me. It's like, See, I, like, I like when he says But trust. I will say in this promo, he only says it once at the end. But that's the way it should be. Yeah. That's usually that. how his, his the, the heel promos go for him. He just says it at the end. Yeah. yeah. But still, a great heel promo by fucking Jake Roberts. Excellent. I salute you, sir. We're going to go to match number three. What? I'm sorry? It's Jake's night. This night is Jake's yeah, night. Yeah, it is Jake's night. Absolutely. This is the Jake Roberts show. We're just living in it. Um, yeah. Match number three, War, uh, the Warlord with Harvey Whippleman versus the British Bulldog. The Warlord is fucking massive. This guy is so big, he makes British Bulldog look small. And Bulldog is not a small man. Um, dude, I keep trying to call him Wardlow. Who do you prefer, Wardlow or Warlord? I like the Warlord way better than Wardlow. Wardlow, I'm done with. I can't have any time for. Hmm. I don't know. Ward, Wardlow is still young, so let's see. What I mean, the jury's out. I mean, like, but yeah. right now, but I like Wardlow. Moment, I agree with you. War, Warlord is better than Wardlow. Definitely. Um, he's got time. Tell you, what? He's still got time to turn around. Yeah, he's still got time he to turn around. He should shave his head and get the same fucking uh, Phantom of the Opera. You should get that Phantom of the Opera half metal mask, yeah. I'm going to say this. This is like two big dudes, and you're like, oh, this is going to be a big hoss fight. It is not. It is kind of slow. It's actually really slow. And there's just a lot of heat being put on the Bulldog and the fucking war, uh, Wardlow. The Warlord, he gets a fucking full Nelson on the British Bulldog forever. This is like the longest. You know, you know what this match was, right? It's like to reset the show. Yes. The audience. Yes. 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 They basically were there to kill time so everyone could get that angle out of their system. Yeah, but it's so like, you know, when you're putting somebody in the full Nelson, mm-hmm. like, can you just make a little effort? Like, he's just standing there. You know, War- Warlord's just standing there. Like, can you just like, I don't know, shake him around? Or, it's just stupid. And then Warlord just throws him off of him. Like, why, dude? You're he's not tap. He's not like breaking it. Just keeping then you. If you know, if you're looking at him like from a real standpoint, you're trying to win the match, right? I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, Bulldog hits a pretty impressive suplex on Warlord because he's massive, and then he does his crucifix cover for the win. What do you think about match number three? You know, it was just there to kill time, and that's all it did was kill time. Um, you Took know, a I'm... lot of time. This is like over ten minute match. So I was listening to Arn Anderson's podcast, and he kind of confirmed something I already thought. He was like, "The mid card matches in the bat in this day were not there to steal the show. They're there just to wrestle, to put enough time for the show, and also not to take away from the main events." And uh, and that's so. Remember, I say some WCW matches just feel like they're wrestling just to wrestle, like they have to. Yeah. Fill it. Yes. And. That's I think that that attitude is kind of stupid. I'm not saying every match he steals a show, but like every match should tell somewhat of a story. And I just felt like this this was that match. We need to fill out 90 minutes. You two kill 15 of it. Yeah, that's yeah. basically what this felt like. I'm also with you. I don't know if that's the 
best strategy, right? Well, it doesn't like, make the WCW shows rewatchable because you can tell when they're just there to like kill yeah. 16 minutes because the show needs to be three hours. Yeah, like I, you know what I think, in my opinion, I think that's kind of lazy because yeah, I, I think do. you can do both. You can make stars and push at least some storylines going while killing some time. You yeah. know, without, yeah, you could have without it taking away the thunder from the main events. You just got to work harder and got to be smarter about it. You know, yeah, you can have Warlord and British Bulldog still tell a good story in the ring while killing time. It doesn't just, yes. mean, but I feel like they were literally just killing time. Like they're yeah, like, like that's what I mean. I think, it's really lazy. I think it's very lazy. They were just probably like, oh, go ahead and kill time instead of putting the effort into go. How can we tell a compelling story that's still different? And, 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 and not and I even think if they told a compelling story, it's not gonna take away from Savage and Rob. Exactly. Yeah. And you just gotta put a little bit more elbow grease and stuff into it, but you know, they're not doing it. Um we get Sean Mooney, he's in the back with an angry rodeo clown. Uh Rodney Savage. And he's yeah. so mad he's getting rough with Sean Mooney. And like a true clown, he starts slapping himself <laughs> and blaming himself. It's my fault. And he's like, I'm going to get you, Jake Roberts. Uh, two Rodeo Connie to me. I, I, I didn't like this promo either. I would have liked it better if, like, Sean was trying to – and he's just running through the arena looking for him. This is where I would have broke – I would have broke the third wall and, and, like, had him grab Vince and be like, where – like, Vince is in the back working on something. And he's like, where is he? I know you know where he is. And, like, throw Vince – you know what I mean? I would have had him, like, run around the back looking for him. Like, basically, like, I don't even give a shit if this ruins the illusion that Jack Tunney's the president. I'm going to find this fucking guy. Or he should have grabbed Jack Tunney. Yeah, grab Jack Tunney. Yeah. Like, I know you know where he is. Where is he? I want him. I don't. I want him on superstars. I don't give a shit. Like, I don't care. I want him on superstars. But I know, like, they didn't have that philosophy. Like, you know, also they taped everything in advance, so they can't tell you. They probably already taped the next few superstars. So they can't like have, you know, they have to have Savage be like, I'm just, I'm really angry, but I'm also going to wait. Yeah. <laughs> because we yeah, filmed this in the, next week, the next five weeks already. Yeah, it's definitely not the best uh, yeah. Savage promo, but whatever. It is what it is. Um, match number four, it is DiBiase and the Repo Man, which sensational Sherry versus Virgil and El Matador. You know, when I was a kid, I did not know what a repo man was i thought he was like a criminal like a bandit i mean he's just like he's wearing a mask and stuff and the way they talk about it like oh he's a criminal he only works at night but a repo man is an actual uh profession it's not like a terrible thing in fact actually a repo man is actually a good person because he's he's fucking taking back items from deadbeats who are not paying i think when vince declared bankruptcy he had to deal with a repo man so he doesn't like them Oh, <laughs> I think you're probably right. Dude. Has I a think that's probably why you're nothing but a common criminal. And these guys yeah. are like, dude, you're the one who's not paying for shit. Yeah, I think Vince had a. I think Vince did not like re repo man. So whenever Vince makes like a profession up. evil, because he had a problem with that profession, like the like the right to censor. Yeah, yeah, or the IRS and the. Yeah. <laughs> This guy is so stupid. He's such an idiot. He's such so an petty. Idiot. He's so petty. He's so he's such a fucking he's such an insecure man. If you look at the grand scheme of Vince McMahon, he's so insecure. And all his like machismo is if you think about it, it's all a front. It really is. What did what did somebody what did somebody say? As somebody my my friend who doesn't want who used to watch wrestling when I was a kid, he asked like why why did this happen like this like some story? I'm trying to explain it to him. And I go like. Actually, the real reason is he. Actually, the real reason for everything. Whatever, whenever you have a question about a WWF storyline, it's just the answer is that's how Vince wanted. It just doesn't matter if it made sense. Yeah. No, that's that's actually absolutely right. A lot, a lot of things in WWF, the history that doesn't make sense, but doesn't matter. That's just what he wanted, right? Yeah. So, and like, if you're like, why, did, why this, this? You're trying to make sense of it. That's the sense of it. He just felt like doing. Yes, basically, yes. Um. So people, um, they fucking still love DiBiase's versus uh, Virgil because whenever those two are in the ring together, people are going ape. Um, during this match, Bobby Heenan makes a plethora of fucking uh, Mexican jokes. I know they calls, love Mr. Tito. Yeah, he calls Tito Santana Mr. Guacamole Dip. He goes, "Oh, they're gonna go in the back and have a bowl of rice together." I thought you said he calls up Guacamole Dick. 
Oh no, he called him Guac- guacamole dip. I think Mr. Yeah. Guacamole dip because he's wearing green pants, I guess. And he goes like, "Oh, they're gonna go in the back and have a bowl of beans." And he said, <laughs> "He said, Tito Santana found his roots in the bottom of a bowl of menudo." <laughs> Not even a real food. That's a fan. No, that's a no. That's a you never had menudo. I had. Oh, it. that is a food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's a fan. It's like intestines or something like that. Um, Ray, as the resident Mexican American, can you tell me how you felt about all these? Oh, I love it. I don't care. I don't care. Oh yeah. <laughs> I love though how Mexicans are like still like. I feel like if Tito was around, Corey Graves could make these jokes, and no one would care. You think so? Yeah, Mexicans. You can make fun of Mexicans, and like no one bats an eye. It's like the last group you can kind of just be really like shitty about, and people Mexicans will complain, but other people will be like, oh, okay. That's kind of like how I feel about Asian. I mean, Asian jokes. I'm like, eh, nobody cares. I'm trying to think. Who's a, is there a Mexican? Oh, I guess technically, like, not like. I was gonna say, are there any Mexican wrestlers around right now? I'm like, actually, there's tons. There's tons. Yeah. AEW. We will give him this. I do like the fact that he he brings in all these fucking Asians. I fucking love that. Yeah. You know. You know, it's kind of fun to see them. Anyways, um, I will say this in this match. We've been watching these pay-per-views with fucking Virgil on it, mm-hmm. and you see this progression of him getting definitely getting better in the ring, where he's a guy actually got more moves, and even in this match, he's gotten better. But midway in, he hits a fucking terrible-looking Russian leg sweep. It's like one of the worst Russian leg sweeps I've ever seen. I was like, ugh. Sherry, in the end, Sherry hits, uh, she nails Bibiasi with one of her heels by accident. But uh, Repo Man is able to give like Virgil a kidney shot for DBS to cover him for the win. What did you think about this match? It was all right. I mean, I didn't hate it as much as the British Bulldog match, but it also felt like a uh, time killer. Also, this is kind of the end of Virgil's push. He becomes a jobber after this. Um, you know what they shouldn't have? Because he's still like pretty over with the fans. I know. they. I think Vince, uh, after this, because once you get to 92, he's just getting destroyed. In ninety two, ninety three, he's just he's just being destroyed by everybody. The next he years. is, and, um, but but if you watch this, he's still over. But I guess that's just what he wants. Vince wanted at the end. Vince right? wanted. Vince was like, you that's had your you little, want. you had your little year where you were over, and now I'm going to humiliate you. Yeah, I bet you I could hear his arguing like, but but Vince, I'm still over. Sure you are, pal. <laughs> right? It's like. No, but I am. People, it's like, yeah, 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 but you're going to lose. <laughs> it's like, I can see the frustration of these wrestlers when they're talking to him because it's like, dude, he is over. He's 100% over. You Doesn't know? Matter. In in a sense, he's more over than Tito Santana in this match. Yes, but Vince. And it doesn't matter. He's the one who Tito. takes the pinball. Yeah, it just doesn't matter. <laughs> Vince believes in Tito. He doesn't believe in Virgil. So it's over. Yeah, yeah. He, or he's whatever. Something happened with disillusioned Vince, and now that's it. And now, yeah. and you know what? Vince Vince decided this guy's going to be a loser. And how does everyone see Virgil nowadays? As a loser. As a but loser. Let me tell you, 1991 was the year of Virgil. Yeah, Virgil will always, he'll always have that. You know what? That's, yeah, nobody could take that away from him. He'll he'll always have that, you know? Some guys don't even get a year. Look at Doug Summers. That guy don't get a fucking year. You know? Tom Zink doesn't have a year. What? Tom Zink doesn't have a year where he's like super over, and he's Dolph Ziggler. Wins. Tom Zink, Tom Zink, Tom Zink, yeah, the Z-Man, exactly. And Zink is Z-Man, super over, yeah. Wait, do you see what happens to the next few pay-per-views? Virgil is just getting the shit beat out of them left and right. No, I remember that because I remember as a kid, I used to be really confused by that because, believe it or not, as a kid, I was a big Virgil. Well, because it was cool to see him rise above and like you. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. It's like I was. And he just kind of beat really him high on him. Like I remember him wearing that stupid mask. Remember that was how he was wearing a mask because his face got destroyed and everything. And I was like, oh, once his face fully heals, he's gonna. I was like, once his face fully heals, you'll see he's gonna come right back on, and start climbing the ladder. And he just was like losing. There were times where he didn't even get entrance. He's like just sitting in. The, he's like already Dude, in the. Room. You know what's another thing that Vince likes to do? I have noticed this. Is that you're like treated like shit. You're like an underling, or you're treated like garbage. And then you rise up and like you can't treat me like fucking garbage, right? And then you start proving that you you're right. He's done this. He's done this with Eugene. He's done this with Virgil. There's a couple of Hurricane. You can't treat me like garbage. I actually have some worth. And then you start getting some wins, but then 
you lose over and over and over and over again. And it's proven right that you were just nothing but a piece of shit and you never should have stood up for yourself. That, yeah, he did that with a lot of people. Dude, he used to do that with Hurricane. Like, like Hurricane stood up with some of the Rock, got one win, and then he just lost for years and then said being the Hurricane is stupid. And like... Dude, he loves that. He loves like the little guy who stands up for himself and, and just gets a little bit and then just gets crushed by the world. Just gets crushed. I think the last person he's done that with was Apollo Crews. Yeah, also Santino Morello. He liked doing that. He did that with him and then he turned him into a heel. He likes you to, he likes you to kind of be like the one, two, three kid he did it with. He that's that's a that's a thing he likes. He likes doing that. It's almost to say like you you need to know your place. He's kind of like doing this high. Like, Eugene, like, the whole first half of the Eugene storyline is, like, hey, man, even though he's special needs, he can still he can still hang. Like, special needs people are people, too. And then, like, the rest of Eugene's like, no, they're not, actually. They're <laughs> subhuman. And he never should have even tried to stand up for himself. And that's the, kind of like Virgil's story. Because at the... Yeah, man, he's... That's, that's right up his M.O. He, Junior loves shit like that. Do you, do, do you remember what happened in 2010? What happened in Ted DiBiase gives Virgil to the son. And yes, Virgil, Ted DiBiase Jr. Yes, priceless. He gives it to yeah. Ted DiBiase Jr. And then and then it ends with Ted DiBiase Jr. just being the shit out of Virgil and shoving money in his mouth, and you never see Virgil again. So, like Virgil goes back to work for the son, then gets beat up by the son, and then just vanishes. Yeah, it's um Mm-hmm. That's long term storytelling from Vince. Don't stand up for yourself. Yeah, yeah know he, that he you're beneath him. Yeah, basically, don't stand up for yourself. Yeah, he likes shit like that. Yeah, yeah. unless unless you're an elite person, unless you're a Roman Reigns, then you can stand up for yourself. Yeah. So me and Gene, he is in the back with Hulk Hogan, and Hulk Hogan cuts a promo on Undertaker, recapping everything that happened in the Survivor Series with Ric Flair and everybody, and then he says, you know, the real survivors are actually the kids, the Hulkamania. Who believed in the four demandments, right? I was like, all right, yeah. all right man. <laughs> We're going to go to our final match. This is for the WWE, WWF world title. It is the world champion Undertaker with Paul Bear versus Hulk Hogan. You know what I noticed while I was watching this match? Right. They are no longer blurring the WWF logo. Oh, maybe something happened. Yeah, and I noticed this, like, I don't know if you know, but remember earlier this year, Bad Bunny in the SmackDown in Puerto Rico had a WWF jacket. They added to it. Yeah, I remember that. Blur yeah. that. And then if you watch this, you see, you, it's not even just like, oh, they missed it. You see the WWE, WWF logo multiple places. It's huge. And none of it is blurred. Not even on the turnbuckles. And I'm if, like. If, 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 can I ask you a question? Would you yes. want to change the name back to WWF? Because I would. Because you said you would? Yeah, I would want it to go back to WWE. It makes more sense. Yeah, they, I mean, that's like stealing TNA's thunder. But yeah, that's fine with me. Because because now it's part of TKO. It's part of TKO, right? And and TKO is two different companies, UFC and WWE. But it makes more sense to call it the World Wrestling Federation because it's a group of people wrestling. Obviously, we know it's entertainment. Like... The world wrestling entertainment, like I'm the champion of entertainment. I'm the champion of the federation. Sounds so much better. So maybe I don't know. I did notice that, and that means something happened behind the scenes that nobody is talking about. Yeah, definitely happened because they're not blurring the. There's two different styles of the old WWF logo: the Attitude Era style and the, uh, I guess the, uh, I don't know, the, the classic logo. Nobody's blurring it, and. If they did go back to WWF, I think it would make huge news. I, I think a lot of people would be very excited. I, I would be very excited. Yeah, I think it would be very exciting. Yeah, 100% think it would be very exciting. Will, that, will anything change? No, but no, it'll be but that's exciting. The, I don't need them to change anything. Whatever their plans are, they can keep them. I just want to call it WWF. That's all I yeah, want. Yeah, it that's- sounds kind of fun, more fun than, than WWE, but yeah, it'll be pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, so, uh, the match starts with Undertaker and Paul Bear both, like, you know, putting the boots to fucking Hogan. Uh, Jack Tunney is sitting ringside as promised that he don't do shit about the double team. Great president. Um, Hulk Hogan, by the way, when, when he's on live TV, he seems very lost. He is yeah, not- he's like... 
he seems very non-presidential when you see him actually there. And he, I, I could totally, I don't, I think that was a mistake because I think that really started exposing him a little bit, you know? But um, I, I, I think they needed him, they needed him there to, to keep the Ric Flair, Jake Robert, they all these things. Oh, need, yeah, yeah, actually, they needed him in this match. They yes. needed him there. It's just like, I think you don't see him ever really get more physically involved ever again. They, they just keep him in the boardroom. But I think Vance was like, all right, it's been it's been five years with this guy. I think we can put him in we can put him in an angle and and then he just looked like, Where am I? Yeah, like he was just sitting there in a chair and he wasn't like like he's supposed to be like, I'm here to make sure there's no fucking funny business. And when this is happening where Paul Bear is attacking, he should be like, What the hell are you doing? Getting up from his seat at least. He probably he probably was like figuring out what what type of cut am I gonna get from tonight, even though it's not in character. Yeah, that's probably what he was thinking, yeah. <laughs> um Hulk Hogan hulks up and he's you know, they're battling back and forth. There's a point where Undertaker's running the ropes and he gets tripped up on the ropes. That thing where you accidentally go underneath one of the ropes and it fucking like clotheslines you. I never seen the Undertaker that happens in Undertaker before. And it was kind of weird seeing that. Um Hogan, uh Undertaker tries to do the rope walk, Hogan throws him off from the rope walk, and that's right when Ric Flair does come out. Ric Flair comes out and while he comes out, Tunney actually starts arguing with him. I was trying to send him back. And while they're arguing, Hogan, like the true heel that he is, picks up a fucking chair. And he hits Ric Flair with the chair. And Flair fucking falls on top of Tunney. This takes Tunney out. He's out rolling on the floor. And Flair gets up on the apron with the chair. Saying, here, ram Hogan's head into this. But Hogan reverses it. And he rams Taker's chair head into the chair. And then he takes out Flair, but Taker still gets back up because, you know, Undertaker is, like, powered by the urn, right? He just keeps yeah. getting back up. He's like a zombie. Oh, Paul Bear's in the apron with the fucking urn, and he's like, here, Undertaker, fucking Ram Hogan's head into this. And fucking Hogan reverses that shit, too. And and Taker gets hit with the fucking urn. And then Hogan oh, dumps out the ashes. Yeah, he takes the like, urn. You know, dumps they... out the fucking ashes. Because, like, the whole mystery was... Like he gets the power from the ashes in the urn, and then Hulk Hogan just so like the ashes are gone after this, but they never really mentioned it in this Undertaker saga. I think that's supposed to be Kane's ash ashes later on. They were. I, I thought it was supposed to be the ashes of his parents. That might all. So ashes is oh, people who died in that fire. Yes, but or Hogan just a flashlight. Years Hogan later, just dumps it out. Yeah, Hogan. He doesn't just dump it. He fucking dumps it out, and he takes some in his hand. And he throws it in fucking Taker's eyes. Didn't he do that recently? Like, he threw salt in somebody's eyes? Yeah. And well, he does like, that to Yoko. Yo, Yokozuna, he throws salt into the eyes. No, he did that previously in a, in a pay-per-view. Already. Oh, so, uh, Slaughter. Slaughter, maybe. Yeah, and I'm like, but you're the good... No, I think he did it to the Earthquake, too, or something. I'm like, you're the good guy. Why are you doing this? <laughs> right? yeah. Anyway, he throws the ashes in Taker's eyes, and he rolls them up for the win. And then he fucking hits Taker... After the match, he hits Taker with the belt to kick him out of the ring for good measure. And I was like, you know what? Hogan, like, 1991, you really did a lot of damage to your reputation and your own legacy this year. He really did. Because it was almost like, I, you know, I think that the only compromise that Vince got with him was, like, don't hit the leg on Undertaker. Do the roll-up, right? Because he doesn't hit the leg on Undertaker. Yeah, that's true. That's the only compromise that Vince got. But Hogan makes Undertaker pay for the fact that he had to put him over last week. Like Hogan does every Hogan does everything he can to make Undertaker look like an idiot in this match. It's kind of funny. It's kind of like depressing to kind of not dis depressing, disappointing to see how self-conscious Hogan was himself. You know, yeah. like he had basically all of the 80s to himself, right? And he built this tremendous legacy where, like, everybody respects him. And when he starts doing this, like, in my early 20s, this is all I heard about Hogan. Yeah. How he would try to sabotage people and stuff. And this is where it comes at. This one year did him so much damage because this is going to be his reputation for, like, a lot of people, you know? Yeah, well, you know, but I, I don't. I think he didn't want to put over Undertaker, and I think Vince was like, "I need to put him over," 
I think he thought we'll build up Undertaker and I'll beat him like I beat King Kong Bundy and Big John Studd and we'll keep going. And I think Vince is also looking. I need like not just like beating him. It's like, oh, you know, by the way, that power that you get from the earth, I'm gonna fucking damage that. Oh, he, just, <laughs> he does everything he can to make sure the other character is over. Yeah, yeah. This, it's like you know when like what was it like somebody would hit him with a finisher and he'll just pop right up, right? Like he doesn't just beat somebody. He like he like completely ruins everything about them. Like he ruins their aura. Like not only am I gonna beat you, I'm gonna make sure that you never pose any threat to me ever again. But but you here's this is how you're going to make money, you know? But here's here but guess what? Uh this was this was not released on VHS. It was hard. It was, but it was like wasn't a lot of video stores. This, this was hard to find. Guess what wasn't hard to find? Guess what was everywhere? You Survivor know, Series 1991. So that's what stays, not this rematch. What stayed in everyone's mind is how final Undertaker beat him. And uh how like the def- definitive Undertaker's victory was, and that's look where Undertaker, look where Undertaker wound up, voting for Donald Trump. No, but still, uh, yeah. I'll, over all in all, uh, I like the first two matches, and then the show just kind of like falls off for me. But it's short, so if you just want a short, if you want like basically a raw size pay per view, not the worst. It's like an hour and thirty minutes on Peacock, yeah, and it's... I think as soon as you're like really sick of it, it just ends. Yeah, I think if you don't want to watch this pay per view at all ever, that's fine. I yeah. think it might be if you want to see real good heel work, it's good watching the Jake Roberts uh, Savage stuff, including the promo afterwards. So if I you're think in that's the mood, if you're in the mood for this era, 1991 WWF. Um, I would say watch this over Survivor Series because it's shorter, and uh, the moments are more, and the two first two matches are way better than anything on that show. So. If if you're just in the mood for this era uh, and you want to watch a pay per view, watch this over Survivor Series. Um, man, I don't know that Survivor Series 1991, Undertaker versus Hogan's a really, I think to me that's a great match. I it's like Skinner like, Bret Hart better. Oh, really? I and there's that promo by Ric Flair that. I think oh no, was- yeah, it's a good show, but I'm just saying like. I, I if someone's like, what should I watch? I only can only have time for one show tonight. Survivor Series or Tuesday in Texas? I only have one show, uh, one time for one show tonight. It is AW Dynamite. <laughs> oh, uh, guys, that's it for today. Hey, don't forget we have a Patreon Goots for Life. Please subscribe. Five dollar tire. Let's see the video of this podcast, and you would have saw Andrew Lee jerking off the entire time. Not that way. Yes, I hey, showed next too. Uh, let's go over the next four weeks. Um, we're gonna refrain from talking about Survivor Series in full gear right now because. We'll talk about it next time because we'll know the results of both shows. Next time that we're we're together, Andrew Libro, we're going to be talking about Starcade 91, which is the Battle Bowl tournament, the first one ever. Two weeks from today, we're going to be talking about Royal Rumble 92. We're already in 1992, and that is the Royal Rumble match, of course. Three weeks from today, we're going to be talking about LPWA's pay-per-view, which is Ivory and Tory in it. And then a month from today, we will be discussing Super Brawl 2, which is Sting versus Legs Luger for the WCW title. Ooh, former friends, former teammates going at it. Good friends, but what are you excited for? Um, I actually would be interested in watching Sting versus Lex Luger. These are the two guys who were the, you know, the guys who were going to inherit the uh, the kingdom in WCW and they're finally going at it. Remember, I w- I remember he was saying like this is who I would have put in the main event like years ago in WCW. Yeah. Well, know? this so, is also Lex's goodbye to the he goes WWF right after. So, um, yeah. So, so what about you? What are you looking most looking? Oh, for? the Royal Rumble. I love that Royal Rumble, and it'll be fun to rewatch it, especially now that I've really fully seen. I never really fully saw Survivor Series or Tuesday in Texas. Always like this. I've I watched it's so funny. I watched SummerSlam ninety one all the time, and I watched Royal Rumble ninety two all the time. But I would skip these two. And now that I've seen both, it'll be fun to go in with a no, more knowledge of this era than I had before. So yeah. I mean, that is gonna be. I mean, the only reason is I, I've seen it so many times, but obviously it is a classic, one of the most classic Royal Rumbles of all time. I'll tell Absolutely. you what I'm not looking forward to at Starcade next week because it's more. Ta- it's another tag team tournament. It's just these motherfuckers. They just Dude, they make they make it so hard to root for them. They really do. I'm not looking forward to that women's paper. I mean, me neither. But we got to do it. It's got to be done. This is this is the this is the journey we we've, we've decided to take. Guys, again, Patreon, a dollar support, five dollars for video. 
Please follow me on Instagram, Ray Goots. Uh, follow me on TikTok, Ray Goots uh, Comedy. Follow Andrew Lee, Andrew Son of Lee. And subscribe. Give us a review. And leave a comment if you're watching us on YouTube. Or even on the Patreon, leave a comment. Let us know what you thought of Tuesday in Texas. Yeah, even if you disagree with some of our takes, just let us know. Well, well, no. If you disagree, you disagree you're wrong. And you're probably yeah, we'll let you know why you're wrong. Yeah. And you're probably Tony Khan. So. <laughs> All right, guys. We'll see you next week for Starcade. Dude, can you believe we, we did eight Starcades this year? That's like the I can't best. believe it. And I can't believe, um, you know, it's really opening my eyes up to Starcades. They're not that good. They're, they're terrible. But and we're ready for another shitty one next week. We'll see you then.